in which the last dangling threads of our story play out in the aftermath of Anna's death. Chapter 2 Sergei Ivanovich and Katavasov had only just driven up to the Kursk railway station, particularly alive with people that day, climbed out of the carriage and looked around for the footman who was coming after them with the luggage, when the volunteers arrived in four hired cabs. Ladies with bouquets met them, and, accompanied by the crowd that poured after them, they went into the station. One of the ladies who had met the volunteers addressed Sergei Ivanovich as she came out of the waiting room. You've also come to see them off? she asked in French. No, princess, I'm traveling myself, for the rest of my brothers. Do you always see them off? Sergei Ivanovich said with a barely perceptible smile. One couldn't possibly, replied the princess. Is it true that we've already sent eight hundred men? Malthinsky didn't believe me. More than eight hundred. If we count those who weren't sent directly from Moscow, it's over a thousand, said Sergei Ivanovich. Well, there, just what I said, the lady agreed joyfully. And it's true that nearly a million has been donated now. More, princess. And how about today's telegram? The Turks have been beaten again. Yes, I read it, replied Sergei Ivanovich. They were speaking of the latest telegram confirming that for three days in a row the Turks had been beaten at all points, and had fled, and that the decisive battle was expected the following day. Ah, yes, you know, there's a certain young man, a wonderful one, who wants to volunteer. I don't know why they made difficulties. I know him and wanted to ask you please to write a note. He has been sent from Countess Lydia Ivanovna. Having asked what details the princess knew about the volunteering young man, Sergei Ivanovich went to the first-class waiting room, wrote a note to the person on whom it depended, and gave it to the princess. You know, Count Vronsky, the famous one, is going on this train, said the princess, with a triumphant and meaningful smile, when he found her again and handed her the note. I heard he was going, but didn't know when. On this train, is it? I saw him. He's here. His mother is the only one seeing him off. All in all, it's the best thing he could do. Oh, yes, of course. While they were talking, the crowd poured past them towards the dining table. They also moved there and heard the loud voice of one gentleman who, with a glass in his hand, delivered a speech to the volunteers. Serve for the faith, for humanity, for our brothers, the gentleman spoke constantly raising his voice. Mother Moscow blesses you for a great deed. Givio! He concluded loudly and tearfully. Everyone shouted, Givio! And another new crowd poured into the room, all but knocking the princess off her feet. Ah, princess, how about all this? said Stepan Arkadyevich, who suddenly appeared in the midst of the crowd, beaming with a joyful smile. He put it so nicely, so warmly, didn't he? Bravo! And Sergei Ivanovich, why don't you say something for your part? A few words, you know, an encouragement. You do it so well, he added with a gentle, respectful and cautious smile, pushing Sergei Ivanovich lightly by the arm. No, I'm just leaving. Where for? The country, my brother's place, replied Sergei Ivanovich. You'll see my wife, then. I've written to her, but you'll see her before. Please tell her you've seen me, and it's all right, 
she'll understand. Anyhow, be so good as to tell her that I've been appointed a member of the Commission of the United... Well, she'll understand. You know, les petites miseries de la vie humaine. He turned on to the princess, as if in apology. And Princess Miyaki, not Liza, but Bibish, is really sending a thousand guns and twelve nurses. Did I tell you? Yes, I heard that. Koznishev said reluctantly. It's a pity you're leaving, said Stepan Arkadyevich. Tomorrow we're giving a dinner for two departing friends. Dimir Batnyansky from Petersburg and our own Veselovsky, Grisha. They're both going. Veselovsky got married recently. A fine fellow. Right, princess? He turned to the lady. The princess, without replying, looked at Koznishev. But the fact that both Sergei Ivanovich and the princess seemed to want to be rid of him did not embarrass Stepan Arkadyevich in the least. Smiling, he looked now at the feather in the princess hat, now all around him as if trying to remember something. Seeing a lady passing by with a cup, he called her over and put a five-ruble note into it. I can't look calmly at those cups as long as I've got money, he said. And how do you like today's dispatch? Fine fellows, the Montenegrins. You don't say so, he exclaimed, when the princess told him that Vronsky was going on this train. For a moment, Stepan Arkadyevich's face showed sadness. But a minute later, when springing at each step and smoothing his side whiskers, he went into the room where Vronsky was. Stepan Arkadyevich had already quite forgotten his desperate sobs over his sister's body, and saw Vronsky only as a hero and an old friend. With all his shortcomings, it's impossible not to do him justice, said the princess to Sergei Ivanovich, as soon as Oblonsky left them. He is precisely of fully Russian, Slavic nature. Well, I'm afraid Vronsky won't find it pleasant to see him. Whatever you say, that man's fate moves me. Talk to him on the way, said the princess. Yes, maybe, if I have the chance. I never liked him, but this redeems a lot. He's not only going himself, he's equipping a squadron at his own expense. Yes, I heard. The bell rang. Everyone crowded towards the door. There he is, said the princess, pointing to Vronsky, in a long coat and wide-brimmed black hat, walking arm in arm with his mother. Oblonsky was walking beside him, saying something animatedly. Vronsky, frowning, was looking straight ahead of him, as if not hearing what Stepan Arkadyevich was saying. Probably at Oblonsky's indication, he glanced over to where the princess and Sergei Ivanovich were standing, and slightly raised his hat. His face, aged and full of suffering, seemed made of stone. Going out on the platform, Vronsky sat and let his mother pass and disappeared into the carriage. From the platform came, God save the Tsar! Then shouts of hurrah and jivio. One of the volunteers, a tall and very young man with a sunken chest, bowed especially conspicuously, we waving a felt hat and bouquet over his head. From behind him, also bowing, peeped two officers and an older man with a big beard and a greasy peaked. If you enjoy this format, please leave a like and subscribe and return tomorrow for the next chapter.